Hi, I'm Peter Desnoyers from Northeastern, um, and uh, Isaac Kaur, one of my PhD students, and we're going to be talking about um, our virtual disk project, which um, actually ties into a bunch of things, including um, we're actually hoping to use this with the Elastic Hardware, um, you know, with ESI, because, uh, you know, we want, and, and that's some place where we really want to achieve, you know, local hardware level performance. Um, and uh, let's see, I think, okay, great. So to start this off, the, the motivation for this work actually was a number of years ago uh, in the Mass Open Cloud, we, start, we tried running OpenShift on top of, of OpenStack. And I had never in my life before seen five second disk IOs and 99 point something percent IO wait time on the back end machines. Uh, it, was, it was a catastrophe. And what we discovered, and I'm sure a lot of other people have discovered, is that, um, is basically that virtual disks are a great way to take fast, fast, expensive storage and turn it into moderate speed, even more expensive storage, or to take, you know, moderately priced storage and turn it into really slow, but still not very cheap storage. Um, and if you're trying to build a cloud, especially an open cloud where you're scrambling around for funding and donations, um, the massive amount of equipment you need to throw at getting good virtual disk performance is really a problem. Um, and basically, virtual disks are everywhere. I mean, virtual, virtual machines run on virtual disks. You know, a huge fraction of the cloud of internet services is virtualized. It's, they deal with rights that, with, with workloads that are very difficult. Small rights, um, high write throughput. Uh, Isaac has some stats on this. Um, and really, as a cloud user, they're basically still the best way to get raw storage. You know, if you want to put a storage service on top of someone else's cloud, you're stuck with putting your data on, you know, you're often stuck with putting your data on a virtual disk and you have to deal with its performance. So in this talk, we'll talk about cloud workloads um, and, well, virtual disk workloads. Uh, some about existing solutions and why the overhead in Ceph RBD, the LSVD architecture and experimental results. And so this section is going to be Isaac discussing his work and then I'll come back to uh, discuss sort of advantages and lessons from a you know, thousand foot level. So. What we've been building, as Peter mentioned, is a virtual disk for use in modern data centers and cloud workloads. Can you, can people hear it a little louder? A little louder. Put, put the microphone closer or something. This, this should be better. Oh, there we go. Right, so, so in order to build a virtual disk that's ready for you know, modern data center workloads and for cloud storage workloads, we want to look at what cloud storage workloads actually are. And so this involves you know, trace analysis of traces people have released. And the surprising turn thing is that there is a surprising lack of high quality traces out there. As we see here, you know, the most recent paper from 2023, uh, a bunch of people from uh, Ch Chinese University of Hong Kong analyzed uh, a trace released by Alibaba from 2020, which turns out to be the most recent high quality trace available of about 1,000 disks. And then we have a Tencent trace from 2018, and then the the a trace from 2007 of Microsoft Research Cloud, which is probably not of use and not representative of anything we might see today. So what they have found in their trace analysis is that, you know, most, for a cloud workload, most of your operations are writes. And the reason for that is caching works, right? You know, you see that you have a lot of read workloads, you put the cache in front of your service, and then you serve most of your reads from the cache. So everything that else that, you know, get, doesn't reach the cache, you know, turns out most of those operations are writes because you have those things must get persisted. 
So over here you can see that you know about 50% of all of your disks have a write to read ratio of about 10. So you know 90% of all of your requests are actually write requests. And you know even about 20% of your disks actually have that over 100 to 1 write ratio. So 99% of all of your requests are writes. So it turns out when you're building a cloud storage system, you're really optimizing for writes because most of your disks spend most of the time writing. And the read is handled from uh, layers far above where, where you're uh, handling. And the key thing about most of these writes that we're discussing is that most of them are really small writes. Right? Maybe it's a database writing something or a file system updating the inode table or some kind of metadata operation. But the key thing to realize is you know, across, you know, not Microsoft Research Cloud, but across everybody else, that most of the writes you know, over th there are the median write size for all, for both of Tencent and Alibaba turns out to be you know, four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, maybe 12. Right? So the vast majority of your writes are small. And for most of the, these uh, cloud storage volumes, it turns out they're also very bursty, right? Application developers are used to being able to you know, request pretty much however many IOPS they want from the back end, and that leads to results, like some of the disks have a bursting ra burstiness ratio of 100 to 1, which means that the peak IOPS and the average IOPS is, up, is off by a half factor of 100. So a disk you know, ha might have an average throughput of 1,000 IOPS, and it might scale up to 100,000 IOPS at peak, and then go back down. And that's true for you know, individual vol volumes, and even in aggregate, you have significant variance in the peak and average IOPS. Of, you know, Alibaba reports 2 to 1, and Tencent Cloud reports roughly 1.6. And Microsoft Research Cloud from multiple years ago have you know, 7 to 1. So our ideal virtual disk would have you know, very good smi small write performance, you know, would be scalable for burstiness scenarios, and that it would be optimized for writes primarily, and would be you know, compatible with existing systems are, and are quite efficient compared to existing systems. So what's wrong with Ceph RBD, right? You know, RBD is the current solution that most people use, and it's provided by the Ceph project. And the main problem we have found with using Ceph RBD is that it has a large degree of write amplification. What we mean by that is every single write must be replicated three times in a tr normal triple replicated pool. So every time a client makes a write, however small, it first goes to the first OSD, and then the first OSD must replicate it to two other OSDs. Both of those OSDs must do journaling or metadata writes or all of the bookkeeping to make sure that you retain consensus. Right? And then once all of those are done, then you can finally acknowledge the write back. And this leads to a very high degree of write amplification for especially sm for small writes. Right? Over here we have a study from uh, 2017 by a bunch of people in Korea where they found that for Ceph Blue Store, which is the current generation of this, uh, the file backend, the object store backend for Ceph, is that small writes have a write amplification factor of almost 15 to 20 times. So a single client write is, trans is amplified 20 times in the 20 backend writes. And that holds for both SSDs and hard drives. So it turns out small writes are really, really expensive. And so what, it, as Peter has previously mentioned, what this does is it turns, for example, 100 disks, each of which has 150,000 IOPS for aggregate throughput of 15 million IOPS. You've converted that, just, you just divide 15 off of the aggregate IOPS straight off the bat. So a 15 million IOPS cluster, just because of the amplification factor, the maximum you can get out of that is 1 million IOPS. So this is how we're turning you know, a lot of expensive storage into not very fast expensive storage. Right? And this becomes even worse if you have you know, one of a spinning hard disk, which are still quite popular for mass storage, but a hard disk might have 500 random IOPS, and if you divide that by 15, you don't really have any left. So which is why hard disk performance is not very good for a lot of these virtual storage systems. So what we've done is we're with LSVDs, we're taking all of these into consideration and seeing that you know, we need to optimize our small IOPS and for write performance. And we, what we're doing here is the main thing is that we're batching of all writes together into larger batches and then shipping them back to the back end as larger writes. So what we're doing is we're having, a, we built our list to be log structured, which means all of, the, all of the writes go into a write log and then the write log is only occasionally all written to the back end in giant batches. So if a client makes 100 requests, we batch all of those 100 requests into one giant request, which is then written to the back end. Right? This leads to much better write efficiency because we're not constantly hammering the back end with tiny small writes. And instead, we can cache all of the writes on you know, much faster NVMe drives, for example. And then 
Um, one of the other things we do is we put all of these on a storage gateway through intermediate between client rights and server rights. And what is with, oh, that gets cut off, but with NVMe over Fabric, right? So an NVMe, which is most modern machines will support, you know, NVMe protocols, and as long as you have the correct drivers, you'll be, will be widely compatible with most virtual machines that need storage, right? So also by putting on the gateway, we can scale, right? We can deploy more gateways when uh, more uh, performance is required, and we can scale it back down when we don't need as much performance in times of low demand. Right, and uh, as you see here, it's very easy to spin up new gateways um, for, 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 handling higher high, for handling higher performance requirements. So what we end up with is an architecture that looks like this, right? A client connects to the gateway over NVMe over Fabrics, right, which is the run over SPDK, and then we turn all the writes into, uh, we journal all the writes on a remote write journal, and then we serve all the reads from a local read cache. If and all of those miss, then we actually read from the back end. And there's a, subtly in where we choose to put the write journal over here. Because obviously we can't put it on the same machine as, uh, we can't put it in RAM for one because if the RAM machine crashes, all of your data is gone that wasn't written to the back end. So that's not an option. One option is to put in lo local NVMe, which is the simplest option. But if that machine crashes, now you have downtime as you, you know, get a sysadmin out there to recover the NVMe drive and put the machine back up. Um, so the choice that we ultimately end up with is putting the write journal on the remote NVMe drive. So that way, if a machine crashes, right, you can just immediately spin up another gateway server that replaces the log on that server, and then we can immediately carry on with a very little downtime. And then for people with higher redundancy requirements, you can put a second NVMe drive and mirror those two NVMe's, but that obviously has a, a cost in both performance and storage, so that's not what we've done for the evaluation. And Another cool thing we can do with such an architecture is that you know, clones and snapshots are essentially free because we have a log structure where everything is just append only to the end of the log. You know, clones are essentially a fork in the, in the write history. So all of, if we clone at block three, then blocks one, two, three are shared between all of your clones and only if you continue writing, then all of those are forks. So I even in the read cache, for example, if we have a bunch of Ubuntu VM images, for example, that all share the same you know, glibc and all of your libraries, then they all come from the common base image, and they don't, they don't take up any additional cache space. So uh, now I'm going to talk a bit about our evaluation of how we perform against primarily RPD as our point of comparison. Our test setup is we, perform, we evaluate both on an SSD pool and a hard drive pool. In the SSD pool, we have it says 48 here, but it's actually 16. Uh, we have a, a 16 SATA uh, hard drives, 16 SATA SSDs, and 48 SATA hard drives. And both of those are pools where we put uh, all of our storage on for both RBD and for uh, LSBD. And the primary thing here you know, we want to look at is that, you know, how do we compare in our performance? And it turns out that, you know, the main thing I want to focus on here is for the write performance because, you know, we're optimizing for writes. And, you know, the green is LSBD, the red is RBD, and we're basically much better than RBD in both a random and a sequential workload. Right? On SSDs, we're two to three times better. On random, we're much better in sequential because it turns out that uh, RBD doesn't handle sequential workloads very well as they all hammer the exact same OSD at the same time. But for hard drives, like, you can barely even see RBD down there because, you know, hard drives performance, as we said, are not very good. And if we can, put, if we can aggregate all of our writes on NVMe drive, we will just have much better performance than, you know, RBD can muster. And for reads, the, you know, the primary thing is we're looking for is that we're not any worse, right? And unfortunately for random reads, that's the only time were worse than completely random reads with a cache that's not sufficient to hold the image size, that's the only time we're worse than RBD for the main reason that we have a lot of cache thrashing, right? Uh, we have newer optimization that, uh, that will detect this and then automatically uh, bypass the cache and the, when we detect that the workload is too random for a cache to be of any use. But in all other cases, we do essentially on par of RBD as in the hard disk case or much better if we, are, if we have any amount of cache locality and we can cache all of the backend objects on our gateway. This sh graph here shows how we scale with multiple clients and multiple gateways. And the main takeaway here is RBD is very good at letting a single virtual disk essentially m take over all the entire performance of your Ceph backend, right? If you have 100 OSDs, the, a single virtual disk that is big enough can very easily saturate the entire available IOPS space of the backend. 
So going from one client to four, one virtual disk to four doesn't really help you um, in scaling up performance because a single virtual disk already takes, a, takes up all of your available um, performance. Whereas with LSVD, because of internal map locking structures, adding more clients and more virtual disks actually improves the performance in the aggregate by quite a bit because we can scale more with more clients. And then the same story with adding a second gateway, actually, right? because most of our performance comes from writing to a local NVMe drive or caching on a local NVMe drive. If we add a second gateway, as long as that second gateway has you know, s access to a sufficiently high performance NVMe drive, we can also essentially double performance compared to RBD that has already saturated the back end. And the last thing we want to p I want to point out over here is that we're much more efficient than RBD at both reads and writes. Right? Here we have a random read and random write workload and we measure the aggregate CPU, uh, CPU seconds used essentially across a, a single workload. And over here, LSVD is about 30 times more efficient than RBD when it comes to backend CPU utilization. Right? RBD here uses almost 1,700 microseconds per client operation for a random write, whereas we use you know, 58. So we dramatically improve our write performance by the simple fact we don't take you know, many trips to the backend when we write. So if we look back at our requirements for what a good virtual disk for a cloud environment will do, right? We have, you know, we have achieved small write performance. Uh, we have achieved, you know, we, we, our virtual disk is write optimized, and we're IO efficient. And all of those come from our lock structure, from batching writes together and shipping up to the backend in larger batches. And then by putting all of this on the gateway, right, we have scalability for very, very, very bursty scenarios. And then we have minimally coupling, minimal coupling between our hardware performance on the back end and our virtual disk performance. And we also achieve you know, very good compatibility with existing systems just by using NVMe over TCP. And I think I'll hand it back over to Peter for the larger picture. All right. So um, I wanted to, you know, step back and uh, talk some about Isaac's results and sort of what it means for us, uh, you know, in the uh, mass open cloud and hopefully beyond. So um, basically, well, and before I go to that, I also wanted to back up to here. So the, the thing here is it's not just that RBD takes almost two milliseconds per IO uh, of CPU time, it's that it does so many of it it does so many IOs as well. So this was using dozens of CPU cores just, just to satisfy IO on one virtual disk. So what, what this comes back to is, you know, we're, we're trying to eliminate write amplification. We're trying to decouple capacity and performance. And uh, then I'll also mention endurance management. So basically, you know, we're starting from, you know, RBD and, you know, other systems like that. They're doing, they're doing everything all at once. You send a write out and they're making sure they've got a uh, write ahead log for consistency. They're updating metadata. They're doing all these operations. Instead, in the, you know, non rep, in one case, we're doing a single journal write, or maybe we're doing, you know, a replicated journal write. And we're handling, and because it's a log, you know, there's going to be a lot of complexity on failure to recover. Uh, but for the expected case, we're doing, you know, we can just do that one or two writes. Um, and then we can batch things and amortize the cost of full stripe writes across the back end uh, and, you know, get much more performance out of the same amount of hardware. You know, we can take the ex we can take the expensive high performance drives and use them for the write journal and for the read cache, and then we can keep piling, you know, more cost effective drives up to build up capacity instead of having to pay that performance tax on every terabyte that we put into the system. Um, so that's the key thing. Um, we're decoupling, you know, the the performance storage on the right and the, uh, I mean, the performance storage on the left and the capacity storage on the right, we're also pulling the CPU usage out of the back end as well. Um, you know, it's to achieve the high throughput, really high um, RBD write throughput, 
you actually need a lot of CPU power on the machines that are holding those drives. And then if, you know, once the I.O. dies down, there's no way that you can use those cores for anything useful. They're just sitting there. Um, you know, instead, we can pull that off. And so if you need, right, yeah. So, you know, where the solution in, you know, in the fully decentralized RBD style picture is you would have to, you know, beef up each of those machines and pay a tax on, you know, your whole storage pool. Here, we can add resources just in the gateway just when we need it. In fact, if we disaggregate the read cache, we're able to take generic machine, compute machines and repurpose them uh, to, you know, to add performance here as needed. And then if the I.O. load drops, well, you can move them back to using them for VMs. Um, an interesting thing that's come up in the last is, is also it's really useful for endurance management because it turns out there's a lot of things nowadays where you want to have a write journal in front of a bigger storage system. Uh, QLC Flash, I'll talk a bit about that. That's a big example. The problem is that, well, Optane's dead. And this idea of having a tiny write journal in front of a really big backend storage, there's a problem. If your backend storage is 10 times bigger than your write journal, then your write journal needs to have 10 times the endurance of the backend storage. And a factor of 10 is small. You could easily want to have a journal 100 times uh, smaller. So it turns out it's a really good thing to be able to put that write journal in one place that doesn't take down all the rest of your storage system when you rotate it out because your NVMe drives there have reached end of life. Um, you know, as the last of the Optane in the universe gradually gets sold off and used, uh, this is going to become more and more of a problem. Um, it turns out this approach works great with QLC Flash as well because QLC gives us sort of the write performance of hard drives, but the read performance of, you know, real Flash. Uh, it's you know, they do insane things to be able to pack four bits into every cell. And so if you want to write less than 64 bytes at 64K to QLC, well, you write 64K. Uh, it has, and it's got incredibly low write endurance. So this idea of a write journal of, of doing very large, uh, you know, full stripe writes works out very well. Um, and you know, so finally to, to, you know, what we've, we've been, we're using this, you know, at this point we're working on trying to deploy a, trying to get this to the point of deploying a pilot in, um, you know, with ESI and hopefully accessible to NERC uh, sometime during this calendar year. Um, we, we want to go further with it. We see, you know, we see an opportunity for something that's, you know, gr significantly, well, more than significantly faster, way faster than uh, the other approaches that we've been able, that we're able to deploy on the same hardware, both for virtual machines, for, um, for containers, and even for uh, booting, um, you know, for booting bare metal hardware. Uh, in particular, the gateway here is uh, we're using NVMe over fabrics, um, NVMe over TCP, and so as as our uh, the target we're providing, that lets us um, hook up directly to various hypervisors. But you know, with some effort, with modern enough machines, we can just boot off of that. Uh, we can also do an iSCSI target for our older donated hardware. Um, and, you know, that lets us treat our bare metal nodes like you treat a VM, something that you can power off, give it to someone else, 
and then later on boot it up off of your disk image, not theirs. So anyway, um, this, the LSVD approach gives us far higher performance. It lets us do a full, full, right, uh, you know, full caching without the consistency issues of other write back caches. Um, it's, it delivers hardware level performance to, to users without them having to tie themselves to either, you know, devices on a bare metal machine or, you know, local SSD on a VM. Um, so, you know, you're able to, you're, it, it reduces one of the barriers to doing, um, oh, to doing storage services as a tenant rather than the provider. You know, nowadays the deck is sort of stacked against you that uh, as a user of a cloud that the provider gets to deploy bare metal machines and build storage services. Uh, you sort of can't. Um, so I guess uh, that's all. And, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, thank Isaac for his work and see if anyone has questions. Let me add one quick comment to this. Just what was really important about this work is is to ESI doesn't really make sense to do any rapid pace um, beyond days at a time or something if you're actually using, or, or for that matter, open cloud test, but if you're actually using something like Frisbee to copy the entire image onto the machine. You know, you can't, you need disaggregated storage. You need to have virtual disks in order to have elastic hardware. And so this is a kind of crucial building block for us. We're getting, um, near the performance of if you had a locally attached SSD to every machine, but it's actually scalable, you can add more or less of them, and we've totally disaggregated the storage. And um, now what we're doing is working with Christy, we're going to, this is, this. we're working with the IBM team on this, but we expect to have a prototype of this up on um, at least one node on every rack in, uh, in ESI, so that we can offer this experimentally um, and start using this for things like NERC as it kind of evolves to give us that disaggregated storage so we can rapidly move machines around. Um, so it's kind of one of the key values that we're trying to build here is we can build research, we can experiment with it, we can deploy it for services, especially, you know, all the elastic experiments and then kind of go from there. Um, so deploying the innovation into our data center with real workloads. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a great example of, you know, what we, really wanted to do with the mock from the beginning is, you know, a problem that came from the mock, research based on it, and then we're finally, after maybe more years than I ever thought, uh, you know, rolling back around to being able to uh, try to deploy solutions, you know, coming back from that original problem. Uh, so, questions? I would say uh, that it's all the all the code that's on GitHub, right? And it's I would say the stability is a bit sketchy right now. Um, but you could bring up the it's an SPDK based server, um, and so you know you and the back end is Rados, so you can point it at a Rados pool. You can run the gateway, and you know you should be able to mount volumes off of it and so on. Um, it's been a little while since, you know, there was a period of time when we did extensive testing of rebooting VMs in it and so on. Um, it may have regressed a little bit since then when we did the performance tests. Yeah, the, the recovery path especially is a bit sketchy, so I would not trust any real data to it at yeah. the moment. That's true. The, before, we had done a whole bunch of, uh, of things like crash tests, and then we did performance tuning, and we haven't done the crash tests again. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.